Thank you very much, Hannah, and uh, welcome, everybody. When Hannah asked me some months ago to chair this event, I thought, crikey, um, do I understand what it is? And I've spent the last few months, because Hannah asked me a while ago to do this, sort of talking to friends who are not stupid uh, about what is blockchain. And you get such a wide selection of views about what precisely blockchain is that it leads a lot of people to wonder, is blockchain anything? And it sort of goes from the prosaic, um, a set of records kept uh, across boundaries with a network of ways of uh, controlling uh, the information via code on that network, so it is immutable and trusted by anyone who uses that network, to, frankly, the revolutionary. This can change the way we live uh, even more than maybe people thought the internet could in the early 1990s. So there's a vast array of differences about opinion, a difference of opinion about what this actually means. And to navigate ourselves around this complicated maze uh, of blockchain are four particularly brilliant experts. I always worry that when the media start talking about technology, the mainstream media, that's the moment at which that basic new technology is over. Because if we get it, it's not interesting. So I hope that the people uh, on the panel here will be able to help us through some of uh, the complexities uh, of these issues. Just want to get a little mood feel for, from the audience. Hannah laid out the question, quantum leap forward or digital snake oil? Who here is in the quantum leap forward camp? And the panel can vote? <laughs> okay, fit <fit's> slightly. <laughs> and who is in the digital snake or a lot of techno people basically showing off about something they don't really know about? Ooh. Okay, okay, quite, quite balanced, bending towards the positive. So let's see if our four fantastic experts can uh, help us. Oh, and actually, there's one thing as well Bitcoin isn't blockchain. I suppose is one thing that we're saying at the beginning. It's on blockchain, but it isn't it. And I think a lot of the public sort of maybe confuse uh, those two things. Who in here has got a little bit of cryptocurrency? Okay, some early adopters here who've lost a lot of value, but depending on when they, <laughs> depending on when they bought it. Depending on when they bought it. Excellent. <laughs> so I was trying to get this explanation. What's this idea, this explanation, really important? Now, Jamie Bartlett on my far left tweeted, very wittedly, some weeks ago, a little explanation. And he answered this question, can you give a very simple description of blockchain for non-specialists? This is how Jamie answered this question. Sure, it's cryptographically supported, immutable, decentralized database system that creates webs of trust through relationships while pushing self-sovereignty to the edge of the network. That was an ironic answer. No, I know, Jamie. Yeah, I know, okay. Jamie. Just you were to be being clear about that. You were being funny. <laughs> um, uh, so, anyway, we'll see how well Jamie does uh, during this panel. So, let's uh, <laughs> let's start with um, Primavera uh, De Filippi, lawyer. She asked me to say crypto lawyer at the beginning. But I didn't mean that you'd sort of disappear or something. or wouldn't really be here. But um, she's a lawyer, expert on legal challenges, the opportunities. Um, of uh, blockchain, is there a way to make them into new models of uh, government, participatory decision-making, that more revolutionary edge of what <laughs> blockchain uh, may be. She's permanent researcher at the National Center of Scientific Research in Paris and faculty associate at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University, also, also the author of Blockchain and the Law. Uh, welcome. To the right, rare I say this, President Witt, as you are, he is the founder and first elected president of the Free Republic of Liberland. Who knows where Liberland is? 
Look at all these early adopters here. There's too many trendies in the room. Too many trendies in the room. <laughs> yes, it's located between Croatia and Serbia on the west bank of the Danube, a um, country which aims to be the first to base its government structures on blockchain te technology and be the freest jurisdiction on the planet. Founding member of the Czech Libertarian Free Citizens Party. Jamie Bartlett on my far left, author, maybe crypto author, I don't know. I have one of his books here, which I do heartily recommend, uh, Radicals, um, uh, which has a bit of Liberlan stuff in there and a lot about blockchain, a lot about new ways um, uh, of, of, um, of thinking around these issues. So author, um, expert in the notion of the social influence of the internet, um, how it changes the way we operate with each other, cryptocurrency, surveillance technology, machine learning, big data, all those things. Basically, 99% of us have not a sodding idea what it means, but we know it's very, very important. Director of the Center for the Analysis of Social Media, which is a collaborative piece of work between Demos, the think tank, and the University of Sussex. His books beyond radicals uh, include The Dark Net, The People, and most recently The People versus Tech, How the Internet is Killing Democracy and How We Can Save It. Optimistic, Jamie. Good to hear. David Gerrard is sort of the IT guy, so you know, if anything goes wrong, he can sort of turn it on and turn it off again. Um, uh, he's been an information technology for 20 years as a systems administrator, award-winning music journalist which is an enormously impressive thing, um, uh, and a bit of a blockchain skeptic, if we're absolutely um, uh, honest. He works, he authors the news blog um, on uh, Bitcoin and uh, is author of the book, Attack of the 50-Foot Blockchain, Bitcoin, Blockchain, Ethereum, and Smart Contracts, uh, which are all different things uh, I now uh, discover. Uh, described by the New York Times as a sober, as he looks this evening in his suit and black tie, <laughs> repost to all the upbeat forecasts about cryptocurrency. So David's sort of the undertaker of the evening. <laughs> he will be, whenever things get too excitable, he will bring <laughs> us back to earth and stick us in a coffin. Um, so let's just briefly go around the panel, just get a bit of a tone about where they are in this debate. Um, President Vitt, Mr. Vitt, is it Mr. Vitt okay? Or Sorry. Vitt, Vitt, just maybe Vitt would do. Um, uh, just give us two sentences. Blockchain, you, you sort of put your hand up about Quantum Leap Forward. Um, why do you say that? The biggest thing about it is removing the third party. And when we are talking about third party, we are talking about things like central banks, like insurances, like uh, banks, regular banks. Uh, like governments ultimately, and it's a really big thing. You know, I'm just saying it like nothing really is big, big is happening, but it's a really big thing. Ultimately, we will not need these institutions in the future because the third trusted party actually doesn't have to be there anymore. So all the things that provide security around the world, forget them. Well, not, not all of them, but a lot of them. Like, I think the, the next big revolution that is happening because of blockchain will be the decentralized insurance companies. And there are a couple startups already pushing that. I think it will need like two or three more years. But we will see that out of these huge institutions that have these huge buildings and a lot of bureaucrats in there, we will actually see a completely decentralized system of insuring yourself, which much cheaper and much more efficient way. Everything on blockchain without any big building necessary based on reputation and on decentralized systems. And can you imagine how much, how much energy does that actually release from the system into the society, right? And, and the same thing will apply with the governments. Primavera, Quantum Leap Forward, digital snake call. You, you sort of half put your hand up towards the snake call side, so it would not be a fellow traveler, maybe. No, I, actually, I, I wanted to raise my hand to both of them. So I, I'm taking a quantum answer. I'm actually both convinced that it has wonderful opportunity and it has actually a beautiful quantum leap. And at the same time, so it's not in the middle, I'm actually bought at the bot extreme. At the same time, it's potentially being used as a wonderful type of digital snake hole. Um, oh, right. So it, it just, it's a technology. Very BBC, somewhere. sort of both sides of the fence. That's, yeah, exactly, I, 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 that's I, my I, position, actually. <laughs> yes, I've agreed with that. <laughs> so it has both um, positives, but also the negatives I mean, I think on it, both it has, sides. It has revolutionary potential. Uh, in terms of 
decentralization, in terms of disintermediation, transparency, accountability. So it can actually create new structures or, imp or modify the internal structure of existing institutions, which I think can have a very important impact. At the same time, those same potentiality can also be used or abused to some extent in order to actually you know, sell miracles. And uh, this is a little bit what is happening today. And to my, to my view, this is kind of this kind of like, you know, especially in the kind of the ICO and like this kind of selling things just because you say blockchain and it's going to solve mm -hmm. everything is to some extent fading, like creating shades on top of the actual real opportunities that perhaps have not yet been explored enough for to acquire the visibility that they could. So, Jamie, the snake oil salespeople have jumped on what could be a clever technology. Do you agree with that or do you actually think the technology itself offers a huge amount. It once, once described in a piece I read uh, before this as, as trying to use the Hubble Space Telescope to look across the road. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, this, this, uh, this week I received a, a, an email from a blockchain startup saying they were using a blockchain to beat obesity. I have no idea how, but that is a good example of the way in which there's an awful lot of snake oil salespeople out there, an awful lot. But that doesn't mean that it isn't potentially very revolutionary, not maybe in the next two to three to five years, but beyond that, I think that the prospect of large-scale adoption of decentralized networks, Im immutable databases, impossible to censor bits of the internet, is going to be quite revolutionary. But that doesn't mean that it's good. Quantum leap forward sounds obviously good. Mm. The quantum leap forward that we're going to get with this is actually going to cause us a lot of problems. We'll build on some of that, um, Jamie, a little later. David, are you of similar opinion? What are your, what are your main concerns about... <coughs> is there a tulip fever element to blockchain which should worry us? I think you couldn't say there wasn't really, looking at the last year. Like, the blockchain data structure is 40 years old. It's a pretty good data structure, it's pretty cool. The Merkle tree data structure, it is not new, but it is being marketed with a bunch of outlandish miracle promises and the implication you'll get all of these promises all at the same time and never mind actual technical limitations or anything. And all the promises that the things branded blockchain are sold with are actually old Bitcoin promises recycled most of which Bitcoin had basically failed by 2014. Like Bitcoin is not decentralized anymore, it's like got three major miners and one company makes 80% of all the mining chips. Um, it doesn't scale up, that sort of thing. It's immutable, which means that there's a bunch of illegal pornography on the blockchain nobody can ever remove. Mm -hmm. So that's a great win. Um, but the thing is the promises were then moved into things branded blockchain. Now, there's no definition of what a blockchain is, legally, because actually it's a simple 40-year-old data structure with a certain amount of marketing attached. I've seen all sorts of things sold as blockchain, some of which, from, on a sliding scale from a full Bitcoin cryptocurrency decentralized to literally just the data structure, like the famous, if you've heard about Estonia's great blockchain revolution, that's a thing called KSI Guard Time, which they renamed KSI Blockchain in 2012 to sell it. And the marketing worked amazingly. I can't even say they're wrong. But, you know, it's literally just a time-stamped ledger. And so when you sell, have someone selling you blockchain, they are literally... The hype is the actual product, and the, data, and the actual program comes later. So there is no technical... Te there is no solid technological agreed definition of a blockchain except something that attracts dreams and hopes. Which might not be a bad thing. Uh, so an old, old technology in a new wrapper, broadly. Yep. Primavera, help us here with what it is. Mm -hmm. Now, you're going to talk us through, hopefully in relatively simple terms for me, if no one else, uh, precisely what it is that we are attempting to talk about. Kick us off okay. with slides. I have slides, yes. <laughs> Just to make sure it's super simple. Um, well, so basically, the easiest way to explain the functionalities of the blockchain is by analogy with the internet. So the internet has enabled us to communicate on a peer-to-peer -peer basis, bypassing many of the traditional intermediaries like 
TV broadcaster and radio channel. And it also has enabled the emergence of those peer-to-peer -peer file sharing networks, which makes it possible for people to exchange information directly with one another. And then, of course, this is very important and very useful whenever it is about exchanging information or knowledge, but it can actually be quite problematic when it comes to exchanging money or any other kind of resource which is inherently scarce. And so this is why when we actually want to transfer money over the Internet, we generally rely on this kind of centralized financial institutions like banks or PayPals, which are responsible to verify every transaction in order to make sure that no one can spend more money than what they actually have. The problem with this system is that this obviously reintroduces one layer of centralization over the Internet, and the system only works so long as we can trust those operators. And so what if, instead of delegating those tasks to the centralized operators, we could create instead a decentralized payment system? And this system already exists, it's Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is a virtual currency that can be traded on a peer-to-peer -peer network without the need to rely on any centralized operator or financial institution. And so Bitcoin was created in 2008 by a pseudonymous entity called Satoshi Nakamoto. And as opposed to traditional fiat currencies like the euros or the pounds, which are issued by central banks and controlled by a state, the issuance of Bitcoin is defined by a computer protocol which precisely stipulates the total amount of Bitcoins that will ever be created, 21 million, and the speed at which those Bitcoins will be generated. So today it is 12.5 Bitcoins every 10 minutes, more or less. And so we can see how Bitcoin somehow replicates or simulates the characteristic of gold. Gold cannot be created out of nothing. It must be extracted from the ground. And then as time passes and the reserve of gold gets depleted, then the harder it becomes to find new gold. And in the same way, Bitcoins cannot be created out of nothing. New Bitcoins are generated every time a computer identifies the solution to a mathematical problem whose difficulty increases with the network size. So this means that the more people are contributing their own computing resources to the network, then the harder it actually becomes to generate new Bitcoins. And so this mathematical problem is actually similar to the problem of finding the solution to a padlock. So one needs to try every single possibility in order to find the right combination, but once the solution has been found, it's very easy for everyone else to verify that it is the correct solution. Now, of course, you might wonder, because it is indeed a virtual currency, then how can we trust the system? How can we be sure that people are not going to reproduce and multiply their bitcoins in the same way as they can reproduce digital content? And so the Bitcoin network operates on top of this other technology, the blockchain, which makes it possible to exchange value in a secure and decentralized manner without the need to rely on any trusted authority or intermediary operator. And so how does this work exactly? Well, instead of assigning to this centralized operator the task of verifying every transaction, with Bitcoin, the history of all transactions is stored on this common database, the blockchain, and this database is shared among all the network participants who are all contributing to the verification and to the validation of those transactions. And because everybody holds a copy of the blockchain, it is virtually impossible to cheat. Because if one tries to modify even a single one of those transactions, the fraud will be immediately detected by all the network participants. And then, once those transactions have been validated, they are stored in a chronological order inside a block of transactions, which incorporate a reference to the previous blocks. And this reference is part of the same mathematical problem which I have described before. And this means that the only way to validate transactions on the Bitcoin blockchain is to find the right combination that will enable the system to attach a new block of transaction to the previous chain of blocks. And so the blockchain is, after all, just this long chain of transactions which reference each other. And the longer is the chain, then the higher is the security of the network, 
because the modification of a single one of those transactions will invalidate the reference to the previous blocks, which will inevitably break the chain. Here is my little introduction of five Excellent. minutes. Excellent. I understood every word of that. <laughs> Come and sit down. Is the, is the issue, given that the data might be old, uh, oh, sorry, the, the, the structures might be quite old, is the issue with, um, do you agree with David that the issue with blockchain is not what it is, uh, which is a decentralized ledger uh, used digitally, uh, but the use, the marketing that la is laid above it. Is that the issue, that it is being sold in ways that aren't really blockchain or at all revolutionary? Well, so actually I would disagree about the fact that the technology is old in the sense that the blockchain is based on a set of existing technologies which are quite old, but the combination of all those technologies together is actually quite new. And it, has created, it was created with the invention of Bitcoin in 2008. Um, and the particularity of this is that the blockchain for the first time managed to actually resolve one of the fundamental problems that could not have been resolved until now except by relying on a centralized operator, which is the question of double spending. Right? So if I have a centralized operator and every, every transaction needs to go through this operator in order to know whether it's valid or not, then it's quite easy to, to avoid any kind of double spending. One, if I have 10 pounds and then I transfer 10 pounds here and 10 pounds there, then the centralized authority will just accept the former and reject the second. If you are in a decentralized system, it's really difficult to actually resolve that problem. And the, the, the radical innovation of Bitcoin is actually that it provided a mechanism by which if I send 10 pounds here and 10 pounds there, then there is this form of consensus making that will actually decide, even though they are both valid, independently they are both valid. So you cannot just say this one is correct, this one is incorrect. And because the network doesn't have a, a common time according to which one I actually have emitted first, then you need this kind of consensus mechanism that will actually dictate whether this one is considered valid or this one is considered valid. And does it become, via that system, a way of disintermediation? Or does it need a checking mechanism beyond that if that trust breaks down? If that consensus is somehow broken? Yes. Is there any need for lawyers? <laughs> there is always need for lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> no matter what. <laughs> Um, I mean, so in, in the context of Bitcoin, the consensus is basically what dictates the validity of a transaction, right? So, well, first they need to be mathematically valid, and then you need to decide which one will actually go. Now, of course, the, the system itself is subject to a particular uh, type of constraint, which you, no one should actually have control over more than 50% of the computing power in the network, otherwise you can actually, to some extent, uh, double spend. You can, you can co-op the network in validating transaction and then mining on the other side much faster mm. in order to validate also another transaction. So as long as you stay under the 50% threshold, then at least until now, uh, it has proved to work. Now the problem is, is a different problem. The problem is, what if I make a transaction and this transaction was not meant to you but to someone else? Then usually I will be able to go to my bank and revert that transaction, whereas here I cannot because once it's done, once it has been validated, no one has actually the capacity to revert it. Same thing if someone is stealing my bitcoins. Right? So if someone is acquiring a particular digital asset in a way that is actually illegitimate, in the real world, I will be just declared to be the illegitimate owner of this, this asset and then people can take it away and seize it with a court order. Whereas in the case of Bitcoin, even regardless of what the law says, if I have transacted my Bitcoin to someone else, then no one can actually come and intervene to actually take this property back. Fit, you started off just a couple of sentences about this notion of takes out the mediators. The, the, the central banks, the banks, the Ubers, the whoever it might be who get between the service I want and me. Give us an, uh, your overview of how you view the revolutionary aspects of what uh, blockchain uh, gives us and the notion that this is as fundamental as a, as a new way of governance. 
I've got a great example, and I will do a small pitch here for Primavera. They're working, there are two major projects now in development. Uh, one of them is Daostack, and one, the other one is Aragon, if you want to check it out. And they're both for incorporating companies on Ethereum. And it's a great thing, right? Right now, you can basically incorporate your company. Of course, you can do it in Liberland, but you can also do it in other, uh, one of these platforms. And you just do, don't get a incorporation paper. You get the whole system of governance that is immutable. You, you've got the shares, you've got the decision-making rights, you name it. You know, you've got the whole company, and you don't need any more lawyers because all the systems that are usually written somewhere in paper, hidden in some, you know, storage, and people just kind of trust each other that those shares belong to there and these decision rights. Everything is now written on Ethereum, and. It's such a great thing that now, you know, these private institutions basically offer much better incorporation than any other nation state could. Because it not just comes with a single list in some registry, but they are giving you the whole company as a system which doesn't need lawyers anymore because all the rules within the company and with the money management are written in a code which is immutable and running on top of Ethereum. And it's one of those great things uh, which I think Ethereum, like tangibly, is bringing us, or smart contracts in general. But what about the point that if a mistake is made, or I want to retract, or someone breaks into it, someone starts stealing whatever it is, my product on blockchain, where is the court of appeal? Well, this is actually, let me pitch for Liberland a little bit. That's, that's where Liberland comes in. And in our jurisdiction, everybody basically has their merit account. That means how much they have contributed to the society that they are living in. And uh, the more taxes you pay, the more merits you have, the, the higher is your vote. Uh, but in our system of decentralized justice that we are planning together with Kleros.io, you can actually, by the system of decentralized jurors, you can take people's merits away. So, okay, it's possible that I steal your bitcoins, uh, you know, I hack into your computer, mm. but if you can prove it, in a system of liberal and decentralized justice, we just put on, the, the, on, on my account uh, uh, liability in the same value as, as of the stolen bitcoins. So there will be always list of criminals, and by the way, it's growing uh, also every day with Liberland. There are You've some got a list people, of criminals in Liberland yeah, already. Yeah, 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 yes. So people that have acquired uh, minus merits for whatever they have done, usually some sort of robbery. Who decides what merits? Right, right now it's kind of centralized, but the main ah, well, the, the president, the president the main, decides. No, we, we actually, it's, like, it's like sort of China. We actually, we actually have a system. <laughs> Only for a while, though. We're going to move on. Well, you know, like <laughs> you know, monarchies have been around. <laughs> here around, around the world for quite some time and they worked well. Let me remind you that Liechtenstein was also a monarchy with kind of dictatorial powers and it is the richest state on this planet. So, but of course, there is a problem with governance. When the monarch go, gets crazy, it doesn't work anymore or, you know, just the son doesn't really want to follow his father's footsteps. So, what we are doing in Liberland, we want to put everything on blockchain, so the whole governance is on blockchain. Maybe use similar platform like DAO stack, but we want to put a, a jurors platform on top of it, a decentralized system of jurors randomly selected from people that will be able to basically balance off all these criminal acts through a system of merits. And, and how did you, was it just you, or was it you and a group of people decide on these merits and then the method for which that will be tested? Well, no, the, system, the, idea, idea, the idea for it is that really qualified citizens from all the citizens that apply to be basically jurors will be randomly selected. And the first round, three randomly selected people, qualified jurors from the nation will be selected for any case. Actually, the first round is a mediator. If you don't pass the mediation, the two parties don't agree about solution of the dispute, then there is three jurors. And in another round, if, if one of the parties appeals, there will be six jurors. And in another round, if one party appeals, there will be 12 jurors. And uh, we want to also include some sort of Dubai Financial District ultimate resolution system, but it's very costly. We would like to solve most of the dip, dis, disputes within Liberland through our system of merits. And again, I, I would like to get rid of this obligation as soon as possible, uh, and, and I know that that is something that will really kick off uh, the whole project. So people will pay tax in Liberland, they, or they do yeah, pay tax? It's a voluntary tax. If you want okay. to acquire more merits, basically more shares of Liberland, you have to basically exchange your whatever currency for merits. 
frightening, Jamie. Anyway, um, Jamie, you've been you've been to their conferences. You've yep. been to see them. You've um, engaged with with not only Vit but many others in Liberland. Is there a revolutionary aspect, which is a reasonable one, to what blockchain can do around uh, governance? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, it's very exciting what Vit's doing, uh, and I, I really enjoyed going over there and visiting it. Um, but I don't think it's quite there yet. Um, <laughs> I, one, there's lots of good reasons why decentralized, I mean, the way I think about it simply is decentralized immutable databases mm. that cannot be sort of historical records that cannot be tampered or changed. So we're talking about the end of censorship, which is very good if you think government censorship or government controlling information is a bad idea. And Vitt's quite open about the sort of both his own libertarian instincts and the origins of Bitcoin itself, you know, from a quite hardline crypto anarchist community who just do not like governments very much. I can see some great uses. I can see how, especially in countries where voting ballots are stuffed routinely, if you can create some kind of decentralized system for people to check that their own votes have been counted accurately, that's great. But why are we so down on intermediaries? Mm. Intermediaries are necessary when things go wrong, and things nearly always go wrong. Code goes wrong. Vit mentioned the DAO, a, a, new, a new way of investing money into a, into a sort of decentralized um, uh, company. Well, we had a DAO already, and that went rather badly wrong because thousands of people invested an awful lot of money into it, but there'd been a flaw in the code allowing somebody to get in and funnel out loads of the Ethereum that was in there, and no one could do anything about it. It was unstoppable because no one was in charge. And David mentioned the possibility in the future of illegal material appearing on the blockchain, but also we have this GDPR about your rights to be forgotten, to remove data. Impossible in a world of blockchain. So these things, I think, could really undermine people's confidence in the way we do government, that no court or police or jury or judge in the world can remove stuff that shouldn't be there. And that is a pretty fundamental change. What was interesting about the DAO issue and the, the hack was the point that supporters of DAO made about that was, was well, yes, it was like, it's like um, stealing the Mona Lisa. Yeah, you've stolen something, but it is immediately traceable and therefore not sellable. And so there's nothing that can be done with the data that was hacked. Is that, is that a reasonable point? That because that, of this traceability issue, yeah. um, that things, yes, hacking takes on a different uh, meaning when everything is absolutely traceable. It's a, it's a, it's, it, that is true to some extent, but with a lot of the other cryptocurrencies, for example, stolen Bitcoin do not get returned. What happens is they get filtered to another cryptocurrency, then another one, then back to Bitcoin, and then cashed out in real money. And something similar like that happened to me, which is why I'm here speaking, because I lost all my Bitcoin. So, <laughs> Jamie, <laughs> share your pain with this <laughs> That's why the I'm family, the Intelligence Squared family, who all love you, um, Jamie. We're here for you. Yeah. Tell us your painful I'd story. I'd rather not go into the details of it. But, um, <laughs> but, but, was so, it a so, lot of money? Uh, no, no, okay. no, no. So, so it's not... It's, uh, it's, it's not the question of perfectly traceab traceable transactions is not completely true. Right. But I think the broader point was that what had to happen with the DAO was that a, a group of people who were running it made the decision to fork it off and almost start again. Yes. And that shows you that, you know, in the end, people then jump in and take over. So the promises of decentralization often fall slightly short. But I don't think we're thinking widely enough. I mean, if we talk about cryptocurrencies rather than just the blockchain, the prospect that governments are not going to be able to easily raise taxes, you know more than anyone about this problem, especially in the coming years with all the problems we're facing, is dramatic. Most big revolutions have started in the past in our democracies over whether tax should be raised and how to raise that legitimately. Government is not going to sit by and let tax raising power disappear because everyone's using cryptocurrencies that are hard to trace. What will happen? Governments will take them over and they'll run them and then we'll have government run blockchains where everybody's transactions are monitored because it's all been centralized by government. Mm. And then the kind of the 
the libertarian dream, the exciting dream, uh, turns into a bit of a nightmare and it becomes a perfect sort of surveillance system. Isn't that your worry, Vic, <laughs> that you create these systems which you say can be trusted and ultimately, as Jamie says, governments have uh, a vested interest and, a, and, and an interest that has been granted them by us citizens to come and say that that system doesn't work for everybody, so therefore we're going to take it over for whatever reason it might be. Now, if you're in China, it'll be certain reasons. If you're in America, it'll be different reasons. And if you're in Germany, it'll be other reasons. But in the end, however much you do with blockchain, if it starts threatening the very structure of, of let's at least say, democratic government based, as Jamie says, on tax, the government's going to respond. The cool thing about these things is that the more you attack them, the more they grow, because it's impossible to take it down. There is this famous CIA paper about, uh, you know, how do we take down Bitcoin? We don't like it. And the resolution is, no, we cannot take down Bitcoin. And uh, the same thing, I think I would argue a little bit there that, you know, the Monero is one of those completely anonymous, untraceable cryptocurrencies that will always be a good alternative to your um, official governmental blockchain that you will have to use. It is as hard as taking down internet to take these things down, which ultimately will make it, okay, some governments might turn off internet because of that, but what it, what it will create ultimately? They're just putting themselves to dark age. Instead of embracing evolution, they're, they're fighting against it. David, you're just too negative. <laughs> You've heard the, the glories of what, what could happen, the notion of trusted um, uh, groups, people coming together to produce trusted networks in a way that allows what would once have only been localized face-to-face, -face, allows you to do that across nations, across the world, in larger groups. And that trusting your fellow person um, down the digital road, so to speak, is better than investing powers in central governments, in central banks, in systems that the public simply cannot see and certainly have no way of controlling. Isn't that the reaction in the public against so much of what is going on now? They cannot see and they cannot control what is going on. Well, at this point, you have to differentiate between the promise and the realities, because anyone can make a really, really good pitch, saying, we will free you from the, uh, your oppressors, but what system have you got in that place? Because, and a lot of this talk about how Bitcoin will overthrow governments is fairy stories that Bitcoiners tell themselves. Governments don't act like that. When Bitcoin 0.1 was released in 2009, there was a message on the mailing list saying, oh, no government could stand for this, they'll come down on this immediately. And, you know, that, that's literally not the history of finance in the last 400 years. What happens when someone comes up with a new financial instrument is the government says, that looks interesting, let's see how you go. By the way, regulations apply. Then someone makes money, then someone else does something dodgy and they say, whoops, sorry, that's a Ponzi scheme. You're actually not allowed to do those and stuff like that. It's frankly delusional thinking that the governments of capitalist countries have something against people making money in finance, because they don't, you know. Um, Bitcoin is a rail against the SEC, but their mission, the uh, US regulator, their mission statement, the third part of it is facilitate capital formation. Here's a government agency who literally see their job as helping you make a great big pile of money, you know. But the second part of their mission is maintain orderly, fair and efficient markets. And their first part of their statement is protect investors. What, you happen, what happens with when people make promise of a trustless currency is you end up with people who just can't be trusted. This is what you see over and over in the cryptocurrency world. It is saturated with the most blatant, outrageous crooks. Um, it is, as an investment, it's junk quality. Um, it's a zero-sum game because there is not really much of a functional cryptocurrency economy. Like, if you have a pile of Bitcoins, that's not a pile of capital that you can invest and grow. But it is growing though, David. The, 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 the number of um, uh, corporations that will accept um, cryptocurrencies as methods of payment is growing. No, it isn't. And Wait for Amazon to jump in. Okay, go on. Amazon <laughs> yeah. will never jump in. 
Um, no, the number is not growing. It, it went up for a while through about 2013, 2014. Then they discovered that actually Bitcoiners don't spend their Bitcoins. It's just not, it's not a very good payment network. There is a use case for it. Like there's, there are, I know people who take cryptocurrency, usually they're paid in Ether because Bitcoins are too, mm. like, too unmanageable these days um, with transaction fees being, tend to be rather higher. But um, it's not much of a use case. I mean, there is the famous one consumer use case of Bitcoin, which was to buy drugs on the dark net, which drove Bitcoin's price up from 2011 onwards, um, up to about 2013, when that price rise up to the first bubble was found to be pretty much entirely market manipulation on the Mt. Gox exchange. There, the trouble with an unregulated area is that people rapidly learn why financial regulation exists, which is that you have to have some assurance that even if your market is a cutthroat dog-eat-dog -dog market, you need assurance the market itself won't screw you over. And you don't have that assurance in cryptocurrency. Well, you do to an extent. So already, already the platforms are regulated, but the currency is not. It's not really a currency, is it? It's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a commodity. commodity. It's a commodity. With some money-like so, aspects. Yes, yeah, so we, we, the regulations don't actually regulate the cryptocurrency, but they regulate the markets that deal in crypto. Yeah, but the thing is, the regulators have only shown up in the last year or so. Yeah. Um, and that is a problem. Like, the regulators um, are slow moving but thorough. For instance, they're now prosecuting a pile of people who engaged in dodgy behavior in 2013 and 2014, for example. It turns out that if you're gonna commit financial fraud, you probably shouldn't do it on an immutable ledger that anyone can access forever. <laughs> You might think that's an obvious point, but they're still busting people off the Silk Road. Um, so if you're gonna do crimes, don't do them in a permanent record. And, you know, this stuff is crimes. Um, when the SEC first was talking about ICOs in mid-2017, they said, look, the Dow was clearly a security, it was actually broke the law, but they tried to make good so we won't prosecute, but don't do this again. You see, finance people, when you tell them, they go, right, we better not do that again. Because they know what regulation is for. It's to make, give your market integrity so people can trust even trading on the market. Crypto people went, aha, but what does the word is mean there? And they got really querulous and nitpicky about it as if the law cared about that, which it totally doesn't. And it's like only now they're finally having to actually issue admin orders, arrest the worst offenders, that sort of thing. Mm. And, you know, ICO people, I talk to people, they really want to do this right. And they worry, well, they bust us. I say, well, no, not if you're honest. But there's just so many dishonest people out there. Because when they see an exciting new thing, this attracts starry-eyed, naive people who think this is their ticket to get rich. And it then attracts a whole lot of scammers to prey upon them. So, yeah, I mean, maybe... I expect that in a few years, cryptocurrencies will be a normal, regulated sort of financial instrument, but a whole lot of people are going to get busted first and, because they just won't be told. Now, Primavera, what, to David's point, uh, will uh, we get to? Will we get to a regulated blockchain system, or does that defeat the point of blockchain? You said there will always be a need for lawyers. Can you control it? Can you regulate it in some manner? Which means that some of the attacks that David is making upon it is it is a world for criminals, basically to buy... Um, uh, there are uh, many non-crooks. To, to work. <laughs> is, there a, is there a way that um, blockchain can be regulated, which means that some of those concerns that are raised by David can be tackled? Well... I'm putting my hat of a lawyer here. Yeah. Um, I think anyhow, you never regulate a technology. That doesn't mean anything, right? You regulate a particular use or application of the technology. And again, what you regulate is, first you need to look at what the applications are, and then you regulate when these derive into something that is against public order or morality. Now, the challenge is that like, if we actually look at the, um, the narrative, right, of, like, the early internet days, we could see that there was all this 
this same, very similar narrative about we're creating this kind of like completely decentralized network and like the, the declaration of independence of the cyberspace, governments not having the right nor the capacity to actually exert the sovereignty over the internet. And then very soon we have noticed that actually it's not that difficult to regulate the internet because there is a bunch of intermediaries and if we regulate the intermediaries then we can indirectly regulate mm. the people interacting on those platforms. Now the, the interesting question with blockchain is that that we actually lose this figure of the intermediary, which is probably the most efficient means of regulation on the, on the cyberspace. And so the question is, does it mean that we are actually, you know, actually materializing those early dreams of crypto anarchy and things like this? Well, probably not, because there is actually different kinds of intermediaries, right? So you have the miners, you have the developers, you have the validators, you have the exchanges, you have like the blockchain explorer. So there is a bunch of new intermediaries, or even just like the commercial operators. So you cannot regulate the technology, and you cannot regulate Bitcoin, and you cannot stop Bitcoin. But what you can do is actually implement specific regulations saying that no commercial actor in a particular jurisdiction can accept Bitcoin. You can re uh, require exchanges or whatever operator is actually dealing with Bitcoins to actually fulfill very extensive amount of formalities so that all the small startups need to run away, and then you only have those large large institution that you can actually very easily regulate. So the, the game nowadays is actually to identify what are those new avenues, what are the new levers that exist on which you can actually affect the use of the technology, knowing that you can never actually stop the technology itself. Right? And so as long as there is a few people anywhere in the world running a Bitcoin blockchain node, then this, this blockchain will be available to people that manage to. So either you have to shut down the internet or firewall everything down, or you will basically just create these kind of legitimate blockchains which comply with whatever yep. regulation, and the dark market blockchain, but they will exist and you cannot stop them. They in, exist anyway. in the yes. same way as the dark net yes. exists to, today. What about Jamie's point about when um, blockchain technology cl might clash with uh, what democratically elected governments are seeking to do, like GDPR, like the right to be forgotten. What about when there's a conflict between those two things? Yeah, so I think this is, this is a very interesting question, and this is the question of governance. Right? Um, and I think the DAO is actually a very good example to this possibility, well, to the problem and to the opportunities that, are, that exist, in the sense that the DAO has shown that if you have a bug, if you have a flow in the code, then obviously then everything will be executed as planned and then therefore someone can actually take the money away from the, from the DAO. At the same time, what it has shown is that it's actually not as immutable as many people claim to be. Because indeed, with a particular coordinated action, then the Ethereum community has modified the internal protocol of the Ethereum blockchain in order to actually recover those funds and actually put them in a contract that people can recover their funds. And so, but the interesting thing here, in, and again, I think this is, this is a very fascinating topic that we need to explore in the coming years, is that the, the Ethereum Foundation, and actually the, the decision was not made by the Ethereum Foundation, it was made by the Ethereum community at large, took this coordinated action because they thought it was fair, they thought it was a good choice for internal and external reason to actually recover those funds, but you cannot impose it, right? So at the same time, when they actually decided to modify the protocol in order to recover those funds, there is a group of people that said, actually, we don't agree with that. We are not going to comply with the majority, and we're going to keep the old yep. model. And so now you have two networks, one that did not recover the funds, and one that actually Do did recover the funds. you think that ultimately is the way it will develop? Well, I think... That we are sort of legitimate well, legitimate, but use that inverted commas, a legitimate blockchain community. And there will be, as there is with all things, a sort of uh, a more anarchic fraternity and also a dark net criminal fraternity. I think there will be many flavors of a blockchain according to the different use. And I think one interesting thing is that 
there is like those two, you can look at two different um, visions or ideology, as you want to call them. You have the vision that is more about like the immutability, the code is low, which is actually quite well uh, promoted and advocated by the Bitcoin community, in which the code is the code and no one can actually touch it. And then you have another vision, which is actually more about distributed consensus, right? So what is the core characteristic of a blockchain? Either it's the immutability or it's the distributed consensus. And according to the vision of distributed consensus, then you can actually quite well imagine, and this is what happened with Ethereum, in which if there is a consensus within the whole community that this transaction was actually not a legitimate one, then it is okay to actually intervene and actually recover, remediate the talk that has been done to a particular party or to society as a whole. Yeah. Vic, can you answer the, answer the, the two main challenges? Home to criminals, and not, it's not actually decentralized at all. <laughs> If you look at what's happened to Bitcoin, it's, it's run by three platforms. Uh, and actually, all, all things that are supposedly decentralized, in the end, end up centralized. Well, of course, Bitcoin is used by different types of people. But, but it's also honest to say that most, like, I think that the research was like 97%, 98% is used by legitimate businesses to conduct legitimate. So it's a little bit of fuss around the fact that it's only used by criminals. Actually, so we pick on the US, controversy, you think? U US, yeah. US dollar is probably used much by much more criminals than Bitcoin is, right? Uh, by, by probably three magnitudes by now. So that's one of the things. And the other was... Uh, centralization. centralization. So the notion of decentralization <laughs> only ever exists until something becomes powerful and then it becomes centralized because in the end, there becomes an operating force which, mm. which becomes uh, centralized. Yeah, when you see that the, the developers are really fighting this back in a way. They're offering all these types of different cryptocurrencies, which is harder to centralize. So you cannot develop a single machine that can mine it. And uh, you can also see that even though the, the players and the, the mining is getting centralized, there is a great incentive to actually keep Bitcoin immutable. There is the incentive to keep it as it is and don't steal, even if you're biggest miner, don't steal from the network, from some particular addresses, because of course you would damage the, the thing that you are working for is there. So I, I don't think it's a big problem. There was a huge debate between the fork when, when the Bitcoin Cash forked and, and to, to, to address the, uh, the scalability of Bitcoin. And there are people that didn't uh, agree with it. It's also quite centralized, but now both blockchains are doing fine. By the way, I just wanted to mention one thing. When Ethereum forked, the interesting thing was that actually the people that didn't want to fork it, that didn't want to go and, and take the money from the person that stole those funds, you know, they were the legitimate ones. Because all, at the beginning of that DAO contract was written that the code is the law. And the, the hacker didn't change the law. He just used as it was written, right? So when you look now on, on, on Ethereum, the people that actually kept the old, it, oh, yeah. the old way, they were the ones that did it legally, right? And the, 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 the consensus actually to take money back was against the law that was set, which is interesting. Yeah, I, yes, I just want to say something about why we need lawyers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, because, I mean, in, in contract law, at least, you have like the wording of the contract, which says one thing, but it's actually just a representation of the intention of the parties. And what actually counts, what is being enforced, is always the intention of the parties. Mm -hmm. So, and there are many cases with paper-based contract in which you have something written, but that is completely not understandable. And if the judge decides that indeed the parties did not intend that way, even if it's written on the contract, it's not it's mm -hmm. not going to be enforced because the intention is what matters. So in the case of the DAO, the intention of the party was obviously not to have their money taken away by an attacker. So of course it has never came to court, so we don't know what the judge would have said, but there is a high probability that a judge will say that because the intention of the party did not reflect the wording of the code, therefore the actual real legal contract that was created was the one that did not include that feature. Now, has Primavera um, uh, convinced you that you will need lawyers in Liberland? <laughs> well, we already have a bunch of them, but... Uh, Are they the criminals? It's, 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 <laughs> well, we have to deal with these people somehow, and, and it's growing. They could all go and live there, and maybe you could fence them in. Anyway, <laughs> because they don't uh, like paying tax. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, Jamie, the issue of, of, is it just a place for criminals to dance and, and do their thing? I mean, is there, is there a way... I mean, that is true, as Vitz says, of everything. 
of currency, of the internet, of telephone, of landlines originally for the older folk in the audience. I mean, all things are open to criminals, so that's not, that's not a way to attack yeah, I mean, it. And, and the criminal uses of these technologies, I, I don't think is, the, is really the main problem. It's, but it is, gonna be, it is certainly has been and will be picked up by criminals as early adopters. That's for sure. It already was and will be in the future. Um, we, we know that there's been a significant increase in the number of people that have been victims of Bitcoin-related crime. I'm not just saying that because I was, but, but and, 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 it, and it's, it's having spent an awful lot of time on the darknet in my book about it, I mean, I could see how this is fantastic technology for those guys. That shouldn't take away from all its legitimate uses. I'm not suggesting that at all. But clearly it means that governments are going to have to demonstrate that they are capable of policing some of these areas properly, otherwise they begin to lose faith in the authorities. They actually didn't do a bad job on the dark net with the dark net market. So I was saying in 2013, 14, these dark net markets, the authorities are never ever going to be able to get on top of them. It's impossible because they use Bitcoin, they use all the various encryption, anonymous web browsers, but they've been quite clever at undermining the markets by basically writing loads of fake reviews because the things like Amazon and so people depend on trustworthy res reviews for it to work. So they write loads of fake reviews, they set up a load of fake sites and then disappear with people's money. And so they've done a good job actually using other techniques to try to keep on top of this. But I think they might be losing a bit of a, lo they're fighting a bit of a, a, a losing battle. Yeah. And I just want to say this, that it's very important. I know a lot of good people that are working in this area and they actually want some regulation. They, they want the authorities to say, you have raised some money with Bitcoin or with another cryptocurrency and you've sold it on and made some money. Here's some HMRC guidance about how you should declare that doesn't seem to be much of that around. People don't actually know what to do. They don't know how to comply with know your customer regulation. They don't know how to comply with GDPR. They don't know how to run initial coin offerings, which is where a lot of tokens are issued for new startups in this area. And so governments do have to regulate, but they're not doing much of it at the moment. So I, and I want them to do more and get in this space more actively because like I said, I fear that then people are going to turn quite dramatically against all of this technology. Yeah. They're dealing too, it's too much Brexit. They haven't got any time for that. Well, yeah, yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, Jamie, what hard. about this notion that the code, the code is the law, which to some people would be a relatively frightening thing to say. Don't democratically elected governments write the law, not coders in flip-flops sitting around in their beachfront whatevers in wherever. <laughs> <laughs> it's stereotypical. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's, yeah, you're just thinking about the weather, aren't you? And where you're, the, the, I mean, it's basically California outside, yeah. so frankly. Yeah, and it's Nevada inside. <laughs> so so the, uh, I think that the, at the moment, um, the code is the law line. Its origins are in the history of this crypto-anarchic world. Yeah, that was always the grand philosophy in the 90s of a, a group of actually incredibly visionary crypto-anarchists who realized that the modern technology of the day, the burgeoning internet, was actually not a tool of liberation, as everyone said. They saw that it might actually be a tool of great surveillance and oppression. And they said, we need to figure out a way of making sure governments cannot control everything and they won't be able to change code because it's immutable, it can't be tampered with, it's like physics. And so that sort of thread has run all the way through from the early 90s into the modern Ethereum, DAO and, and other things. But I think it's actually, I think this is the great tension of the day. Can laws ever keep up with this technology? Are laws going to have to be passed which are essentially based on what's technically feasible? So if we did pass, if we decided we were going to try to pass a law to stop cryptocurrencies, we couldn't do it. So, so law, law and democratic power is, is already limited to some extent by what is technically feasible. And I think that is going to continue to be the case. David, is blockchain ultimately undemocratic in the way we understand democracy? Um, I'm not sure that question quite is a coherent question. Excellent. <laughs> For, rephrase my question so it makes sense. <laughs> I have no idea what that question could mean. I mean, in terms of... The you, notion that the code is the law, that somehow 
Uh, the notion that people coming together set up these systems that are outside the present regulatory structures, which are there for good democratic reasons. Right. Um, is that better? The way that, well, in practice, this is more of stories that fairy tales that Bitcoiners tell themselves, say, aren't we anarchic? The government hates us. The government's not that interested in you. Um, they look at this thing and go, oh, that's an interesting thing. How does it interact with society that actually exists? So what we see in terms of regulation is they don't try to stop the Bitcoin blockchain existing because like as Primavera said, all you need to keep Bitcoin going is a copy of the code, a copy of the blockchain and two or more cultists and you've got a Bitcoin going. Mm. But um, what they do regulate is the interfaces to yeah, okay. the existing society and economy. Hence the know your customer requirements. And James Wright, um, there needs to be more regulation on this point. And I think that, as I said, I think that's the good ending for all of this is that it becomes reasonably regulated financial instruments that people understand. But the thing is, that's part of society. Because the trouble with anarcho-capitalism is that it isn't actually actual capitalism. It tends to be people who want to, you actually saw this with PayPal. When Peter Thiel started PayPal. He was really gung-ho about very Bitcoin-like dreams. Mm. He thought, this will be a special channel for money which governments can't possibly affect. We will... Um, but he rapidly worked out that actually society is where the customers are. Um, society is where the, cons where the people are. And there's a heck of a lot more money to be made in um, being part of the system, more conventional capitalism. And of course, Thiel eventually became a defence contractor, which is the final stage of capitalism. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> now, look, I'm going to come to the audience. Stick up your hands, because we're very technologically light here. But I just want to ask one more question before I come to the audience. The environmental issue, the amount of energy it takes to make... I know that mining is a different issue from the blockchain itself. But as these systems are built, do they not take a huge amount of energy just to run them? Where's Liberland going to get its bleeding energy from? Well, by the way, Liberland is one of those big places for mining, even though not locally, but I think the, the fourth biggest mine and fifth biggest mine are owned by Liberlanders, so it's China and then Liberland, which is kind of funny. But, you know, like, honestly, like, we have to start thinking about, you know, energy in a little bit different way. There is more energy in this glass then this society on this planet will consume in the next hundred years. You know, and, and the, this, this debate about, and it's this classical Einstein relativity mm -hmm. theory, right? The debate, yeah, like, you know, are we consuming too much energy or not? Is just like debate, you know, are we consuming too much of these two glasses or not? So to me, it doesn't really make sense. It's just about us as a society figuring out how to actually release Please, that can, energy. Can you explain that there's more energy in that glass that we will use in the next 100 <laughs> yeah, years? Yeah. <laughs> e equals mc yeah. so squared. Quantum, we're all going to be saved yeah. by quantum physics. Well, no, it's, it's a the thermal nuclear reaction is something which is very, <laughs> yeah. very near. The thorium reactors are also about to start running. I think they just got one up and running in Netherlands. So, like, like Seriously, okay, so we don't have we don't have any we don't have any energy, and, and again, Fine, there is yeah. more energy in this glass than we will ever consume. David, you put your years. thumb down there. We'll go to that gentleman first, here, but David, you put your thumb down there. Is that what about the environmental cost? Then we'll come to number two there. Well, the trouble with those. Bitcoin is that as long as you can get money for Bitcoins, all the incentives are to keep using more and more energy because mining is competitive. So the actual calculations you could do them on a 2007 iPhone. All the rest of it is computers trying to guess numbers to win the next block full of Bitcoins. Like millions of computers shouting number wang at each other 14 sextillion times every 10 minutes with one winner. And this, what do we get for this? We get a payment system that isn't very good and we get a um, sort of an immutable blockchain, well, fine, and that's of interest to Bitcoiners. And um, the thing is that it's not that it's 0.1% now, because you have to ask what percentage of the world's electricity would be acceptable. Like, where would the limit be? Um, because there is no limit. Also, Bitcoin is anti-efficient. Like, when, it start, when Satoshi Nakamoto started it in 2009, it was running on his computer, and it ran seven transactions a second. 
In 2018, it's using 0.1% of all the electricity in the world, and it's running seven transactions a second. As it goes on, it gets less efficient. So if you compare so it to other questions. things, they always get more efficient. Dave, thank you. Number two. A couple of months ago, Niall Ferguson came here with his new book, The Square and the Tower, just about this concept, about networks in particular. He was talking about that there is a dialectic between networks and hierarchies. A new person finds a network, it's used to great effect, and then immediately some kind of hierarchical order comes in to stabilize it. Um, from what you're saying, Jamie, what will be the hierarchical source to govern this new sort of network? You know, we have all these threats from criminals or from people who will um, use it illegitimately. What will be the outside authority that governs it? Jamie, then uh, number four. Okay. And then number three at the back, yep. Sorry. Oh, um, yeah. I, 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 yeah, I, I, I agree. That is what tends to happen. And I, and I think governments will regulate it. Um, I can't tell you exactly what that is going to be. I have mentioned before a couple of examples to do with simple things. Um, the, the, the way that you can stop the technology, of course, everyone says you can't, but is to just ban its use. I mean, so to say, sorry, Bitcoin's not allowed in this country anymore, and anyone that uses it, you, and we can't stop you using it, but we can throw you in prison if we find you using it. And they may well, you know, or, and or, countries like Venezuela saying, we're going to start our own cryptocurrency, and everybody has to use that one, and no one's allowed to use any others. That's the prospect in 10, 15, 20 years' time. That, and the way that I can most likely see this, I don't want that to happen, but the most likely way I can see this being controlled by hierarchies. It creates a system of insiders and outsiders. Uh, Primavera, you wanted to yeah, just Yeah, I just wanted go with, yeah. To, to follow up. I think that um, the, the problem with uh, most existing blockchain-based systems is that they have, so you have a decentralized infrastructure and you need to plug on top of that a decentralized governance structure, right? But the closest thing to a distributed governance system that we know today is actually the market. And so if you look at pretty much every single blockchain-based system so far, they implement a market-based governance system. And, but as we have seen in, in like over the, the hundreds of years in the past, like if you have a market-based system that is not protected to some extent, like the competitivity of the market they disappear and eventually it, it, there is this uh, entropy towards centralization because people are accumulating resources and using those resources in order to accumulate more resources. So the problem today, and again, this goes back to the governance question, as long as we rely on market-based governance, and that's the case of Bitcoin with the mining power, it's the case of the DAO, which was with like, the amount of token that you hold and so far, then of course we will always, unless we create a anti-centralization system through an external institution that is trying to protect that uh, market-based governance, it's going to always evolve into a centralized system. And the challenge today, and this is what we're working with DAO stack, with Aragon and things like this, is how do we actually design new mechanisms of governance which are not market-based, which are not plutocratic-based, but which actually implement a real distributed governance system that, to some extent, there will always be some kind of dynamics that you cannot control, but that is not inherently falling into the centralization. Yeah. How do we get blockchain to work for people who don't use blockchain? Uh, number four. Um, um, as a lawyer, I would, of course, agree with Prima, <laughs> Primavera, but she illustrates a very good point, which is that most of the discussions we've had tonight will turn out to be legal questions that need to be resolved in terms of governance. That's a comment. My question for Primavera is that you mentioned earlier on at the danger if any one entity has more than 50% of the blockchain. Could you just explain that a little bit more? Yeah. So, according to like the, the little example that I have given, so the idea is that everyone is racing to create transactions into a block, and then they need to find the right combination in order to attach it. So, the, 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 basically, it's a probabilistic thing. So you never know who is going to be, but if you have a lot of hashing power, you have a higher probability to find the right solution to attach the block. Now, the problem if you have more than 50% is that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and mine a particular block with a transaction, I'm going to attach it, right? Now, at the same time, I keep mining another, an, an alternative uh, bifurcation of the chain in which I'm spending the same $10 to someone else. Right, so this one has been validated because it has been mined and then it keeps evolving. But if I have more than 50%, when I create this bifurcation, I can go faster. And because the rule of, the, the rule of Bitcoin and most blockchains that are based on proof of work is that 
if there is a bifurcation, everyone will always follow the longest chain. So if, if here I'm attaching two locks, then both of them are equal. If now there is one lock here, another lock here, and this one has another lock after, then everyone will follow this as being the valid chain, which means that these, these $10 that I have spent here have now been spent and accepted, but at the same time now they don't exist anymore because now I shift to this bifurcation. Right? So the ability of having more than 50% enable you to mine faster than the rest of the network and therefore being able to speed up and modify, well, bifurcate and create a bifurcation that is longer than the current chain. So we need Ten antitrust. Yes. We need antitrust yeah. for Bitcoin mining rigs. <laughs> Tendency to monopoly, number Could three. Yes. Hi, good evening. Well, we've heard the grounds, uh, about a lovely country oh. where the people that pay the most taxes have the most say. Um, which was interesting. Um, we've also talked a lot about blockchain and Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. What we haven't talked about is the use of blockchain technology, uh, if you use the term distributed ledger technology, to increase operational efficiency, to create digital identity, to track assets. That there's a lot of things that will touch people in their daily lives that they may not see from this discussion that we've had so far tonight. Could the panel someone from the panel address that? Yeah, the rather more sort of, well, not prosaic, but the more ordinary day-to-day -day ways that it can help us operate in a much more efficient way. I mean, David, is, that's not the snake oil side of it, is it? It turns out that, yeah, it is actually. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, this is something which I spend a lot of time looking into. Um, finding actual use cases, they're sort of few and far between. Most use cases are hypothetical. Now. New technology is fine and interesting, but it's been nine years and they're sort of having trouble coming up with actual production systems that aren't cryptocurrencies. Um, a proof of work blockchain like a cryptocurrency is hugely wasteful. And it also, recent research shows that basically all of them can be attacked really easily with 50% attack, except for Bitcoin and Ethereum, because they're the hugest. Um, for business use, business blockchain is, as I said, it's only defined as whatever the IBM salesman happens to be trying to sell you at that moment. There are very few production systems out there, and most of those don't actually benefit from the blockchain bit. Mostly what they do is they say, oh yeah, and we tacked on a blockchain. Um, famous examples, the World Food Program has a great blockchain-based refugee cash system, which is fabulously efficient. It's a good system, it does good work, and it's got a private Ethereum instance in the middle with one user. So it's basically an expensive, slow database run by one company. There's sort of nothing blockchain-y about it. Prim, very quickly, we need to get around yeah. some questions. Then number one, and then number four, and number two. So yeah. they say, there's this saying that uh, a private blockchain is like beer without alcohol, um, which Sorry, I think a private blockchain is like beer with no alcohol. Um, which I agree, but on the other hand, you have things that are not private blockchain, but are like consortium blockchain, and that actually can have very interesting uh, application within like a consortium of business entities or people that trust each other to some extent, but do not want to trust one single operator. And so in some way, it's kind of a continuum. When we are like in the open public permissionless blockchain, it's just that you really don't want to trust anyone. But if you have a consortium blockchain with about like 100 or 1,000 nodes, which are all validating the transaction, then you know that the collision can actually be quite difficult, in addition to the fact that every node is actually identified, and so if someone is actually doing something that is trying to cheat the system, then you can identify where it comes from and then put it out of the consortium. So there is like, we need to think of blockchain as a continuum from like the very centralized and private blockchain with just a few nodes, which perhaps doesn't really need a blockchain at all, to the fully decentralized and a permissionless one. And then you have like a large quantity of potential design of blockchain with a different kind of no number of nodes, depending on the amount of trust or trustlessness that you want. Yep. Number one. What does it take, or what should it take, for an ordinary citizen to be able to trust a computer protocol? Now, Primavera's image props of padlocks and stock imagery of server racks is very attractive, but at the end of the day, eventually you have to take someone's word for it. Is, is that right? I'm not sure I understand the question. What, what level of proof should an ordinary citizen require before they say, yes, I understand that blockchain works as you say it does? 
this, mean... this is actually a major problem. Um, this is one of the big security problems in blockchain stuff in practical life. Um, you'll have them saying, you have promised that you have researched all this computer code and you understand how it works, and like you have ICO token sale agreements that say this. Do you understand this contract fully? Even the people who wrote the DAO didn't understand it fully, as it turned out. Um, so, so difficult but, to do. Yeah, and in civilization runs yeah. on division of labor. Okay, uh, is there a way of the public trusting blockchain? That's in the end what has to happen. The public need to trust and that the system they are being asked to join works. Hmm. I think the key is the diversification is as in everything. So Liberland, for example, from day one, we had 80% of our money stored in, in different cryptocurrencies and we started to diversify them. Of course, there can be a, a big problem in Ethereum or in EOS or in other, and maybe the, the currency might go to zero from one day to another. It's a possibility. So far, we didn't have a big problem like this, but I think one of, one of the days something will erupt. But for example, Bitcoin has proven itself sure. a great yeah. piece of code, which was not hacked in now how many years? Nine years? Nine years without any major flaw, which is pretty, very, very pretty briefly. exciting. I just want to say, like, of course it is difficult. Uh, the difference is that you can actually look at the code and you, like, someone, like, it's kind of the open source model. You know that someone can look at it and then if you trust that's enough eyes around the thing. The, the I, difference I, with the existing system is that today you Who's the you someone? Have, who's yeah. the someone? I think who's, the first problem is going to be with judges when they're looking at complicated proofs and someone will say, well, I definitely yeah. owned it because look at this blockchain case. Well, no, you didn't. Because, and they don't understand what on earth it is. So the first sort of test cases of this, I think, will be in the courts when the judges try to work out, well, why should we trust a blockchain-based system, exactly. Yeah. But I, yeah, I can see that we can get round to have that. Have you had cases? Have you done cases? No, there's no, no such case. I mean, the DAO would have been a wonderful case, but it hasn't happened. We, we did a moot court, though, and that was fascinating because we, we had two lawyers arguing pro and cons a particular uh, case about the DAO, and we had two judges, and the two judges eventually actually refused to give a verdict because they just said that they could not understand anything. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. What is the battles? I mean, in the end, judges will have to decide. Number four. Uh, hi, I hi. work in insurance, and I was quite, um, I guess, my eyes opened a little bit wider when Vid said that our insurance industry was going to be taken over by blockchain. How do you see this happening? Well, there is a now tendency, and it's, it's actually the same problem that, that we are dealing in the level of governance as well as on insurance companies. You basically need to have jurors that decide if the insurance case is legitimate or not. And whenever we come up with this situation where we can have an organization that can legitimately th inside make this decision if that insurance claim is legit or not, the whole problem of insurance is solved because everything that otherwise insurance company does can be put on, on Ethereum. The only thing you need to have or an, an, a smart contract. The only thing you need to have is a system of jurors that will make sure that those claims are legitimate or not. And I can, for example, I can imagine it like uh, there is a mobile application which runs on also on decentralized ledger. You see all the people from the insurance company that are customers, and some of them are as well judges. So when, whenever you hit a car somewhere, you just click, you know, I hit a car or somebody hit me and there will be the three people that are closest or two people that are closest and they come and they actually see what has happened <laughs> after you submit them the evidence if they don't agree yes. with it and they can make the decision. That there is no more need for any extra big governmental structures, uh, big hub buildings and stuff like that. D d d can we go back to the insurance woman? That, fantastic. <laughs> are you convinced by that? It's the end of you? Uh, no, I think I still see a, a, a requirement for insurance companies. They, they may change a little bit, but ultimately you still need somebody who knows what they're doing in order to run the company and to provide the product but, but again, like, and pay all, the claims. All of, all, of, all of these things that insurance company normally does can be easily turned to a smart contract. Easily, okay? It's going to take a couple of years, but like every single step among that insurance process, creating a bunch of people that basically insure themselves, they put some money to some fund, this can all be codified and turned into smart contract. And that's why I'm, I, I am very positive about blockchain taking over a large portion of the insurance business in very, very Number two. short time. Hi, Dan, uh, yeah. my name is Adam, thanks a lot. Um, my question is, um, just, you know. Wave your hand. May, may, hello, hello, hello. 
Jamie, you were just sort of talking about, um, you know, do we need to question the need for an intermediary? Also, um, the idea that, um, uh, you know, is it, is it a good thing if, we're, if, if there's ways for people not to pay their taxes? That all makes a lot of sense. When it comes, say, not to our relationship with government, but maybe to our relationship with other big entities like tech companies, Facebook, Twitter, Again, like, is there a way that decentralization blockchain can actually protect us, help us own our own data rather than it being used and owned by other entities? Can we control it? To your point about the right to be forgotten, can we say? The problem is that there, there are, the, 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 the problem of big tech monopolies uh, can, to some extent, I think, be can be re not necessarily resolved, it can be challenged by the rise of these technologies. And it, to that end, I'm quite excited about this. The problem is it then is going to create a whole load of other pro problems in another part of our system, namely tax raising and governance and trust in, in the police and so on. So yes, I accept that to some extent, and that's the positive. And the people in the 90s who were talking about this, those visionary crypto anarchists, they called a lot of what is happening now. They called it early, and they were right about it. We didn't really listen. So there are definitely positive uses, but this, I mean, David's right about this as well. There's a lot of potential use cases. There's all sorts of imaginary ways that it might be used in the future. And, and I'm excited about those. And I know this might sound, I don't really want to bring Brexit into it at this at 8.29, but when it comes to international shipping, if you can combine smart contracts with Internet of Things, so you can monitor where things are moving and have smart contracts to automatically tax at borders, there are potentially very, very useful gains there, but it's going to take ages. You're going to have to have an international system of governance that everyone signs up to that's cross-border, and I can't see that happening. You should ring Theresa May. She needs you. Um, number I'll go one. i checkers right now. I think they're meeting now, aren't they? Maybe number one. throw blockchain into Who's it. Who's that? Yes, the gentleman here. Then, then um, yes, and the number three. Sorry, yes. Uh, David Wood, London Futurist. And I think David Gray, uh, David's uh, point about uh, most of these use cases for blockchain turn out when you look at them to be very vague or not to need blockchain at all. I think it's very strong and we've been discussing it a bit, but I'd like to ask, what, what do the other panelists think is the best answer to that? What do they think maybe in four or five years time we'll be saying, thank goodness we've got blockchain because this has allowed us to do this and we couldn't have done it otherwise? Excellent. We'll take, um, yeah, gentlemen there, and there's a, a woman up at the back there. Yeah, number two and then number three. Sorry, thanks. Um, Barack Obama asked the question, do we want everybody to have a Swiss bank in their pocket? And um, Jacob Rees-Mogg's dad, William Rees-Mogg, wrote a book in 1997 called The Sovereign Individual, where he predicted a digital currency would undermine the power to tax and the power of the state. Do you think that that's actually a possibility that cryptocurrencies could undermine the nation state as we know it now? Excellent. And later at the back. Um, hi. I was just wondering if you, if you think that the sort of potential of blockchain is going to be sort of ruined before it gets there. The reason I'm asking is if you think about things like currency, uh, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, it's essentially not a currency anymore. It's a commodity. So the people who are, you know, making money off it are the bankers who we were meant to kind of get around by using the cryptocurrency in the first place. So if we're thinking about, you know, using blockchain to solve the, you know, patient records in the NHS, do you think it's going to be sort of ruined before yes. we even get there? Yes. So, David, you need to answer the first one. What would be a good thing that blockchain could solve? Which touches on the earlier gentleman's question about what are the, what are the legitimate things that blockchain could help us with? I think the good ending here is the one that's happening, which is not things that are full decentralized cryptocurrency style systems, but just having that append only ledger, which is really cool. And there's the data structure that's good. But the distributing of systems is something it loses efficiency and this means in practice it can't compete that well. So what we'll see is we'll see just the ledger marketed with brand name blockchain and I think that will be the good ending on the technological side. <laughs> so, Primavera, what do you think to that? What, would be a, um, what, what about a good thing, a straightforward good thing that the public can understand, oh yeah, if it wasn't for blockchain, that wouldn't be happening? So I think there are three categories of things. Okay, quick, it's 8.30 already. So Two. one is the cryptocurrency or all the token-based system, which is basically creating your own magic internet money, which is the one that we have been exploring the most until now. 
Uh, the second one is the, the registry, like using the blockchain not as a decentralized payment system, but rather as a registry system. And then you can just prove things by executing a transaction and recording a particular piece of content on that blockchain so that you're moving from this kind of trust-based system to a proof-based system in which you can constantly check whether a particular transaction has happened at the point and provide better auditability. And then the third one, and I think that's the more uh, futuristic, but it's, it's getting there, but it's still very experimental, is all the thing that relates to smart contracts. So the ability of deploying software on a blockchain in order to, in a way that is not controlled by any single operator, but that is actually executed in a distributed manner by all the participants. And this is what can create those kind of um, new type of cooperative uh, or collaborative economy platforms in which there is no centralized operator that is actually dictating the rules of the platform or that is taking out part of the potential rent that they get, but actually creating a system of decentralized coordination in which different people coordinate themselves mediated through those infrastructure. And we have some example, like we have like Open Bazaar, which is this kind of like eBay, but without eBay. Uh, we have like some mechanisms like um, like some decentralized social network, uh, like Steemit and uh, Akasha and so forth. And then we have like the more uh, difficult one to implement, like we have Lazus or Arcade City that were trying to implement Uber without Uber. And obviously, we realized that it's very easy to implement. The first two categories are very easy to implement because one is just pure math. You just need to calculate whether the accounts are actually correct and then make a transaction. The second one is just registration, notarization, so that's also very easy. The difficulty with the smart contract, again, it's the, is the governance. So once you have a, a group of individuals that are all contributing to this decentralized organization, then how do you make sure that this organization is being managed, is being governed in a way that actually makes sense, that actually is viable, when you don't have this centralized institution? And for me, the reason why those smart contract-based organizations are not yet fully fledged, it's really just experimental, is because we yet have to identify a proper governance structure to manage those organizations. Thank you, very, very briefly, time is against us. Um, the point from the back, which is before we get there, the whole of the notion of blockchain has been muddied by cryptocurrencies. So these other ideas like patient records, like um, uh, more less controversial ideas will be lost in this battle around cryptocurrencies and who's making money. Let me just quote David. He said that there are some non-crooks in the ICO scene. There is much less of them in the traditional kind of central banking or government scene, right? We don't realize how much governments has actually abused the power to create money. Maybe it's getting a little bit less, but so much, so many times in history we saw a massive inflation, everybody losing their money. And I think, you know, no matter what will be developed after on blockchain, the, the money, the, the fact that there is complete honesty with our money system that you can now trade a currency where there is only 21 million and never more, nobody can else create it, is the most revolutionary thing that we can see on blockchain and nobody will be ever Is it crowding out all the other ideas? Is, no. is the currency issue crowding out all the other I'm ideas? I'm just saying no. that, that it is the most, it is the, the, the use case where it makes most sense actually because it is providing an alternative to fiat created currencies where just government decides let's create another 10 billion and everybody is kind of fine with it and nobody can even influence it. Now we do have a viable alternative. We don't have to use monopoly money anymore. Jamie, just the final question, final point of the evening. Thank you for your patience, audience. Um, you've touched on this, undermining the state by putting the power of a Swiss bank in everybody's pocket. I mean. Yeah, that, 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 that is something that you've discussed in your books and in your work and tonight, but that, that is presumably a legitimate criticism of what is happening in blockchain development. I think it is, and, I, it was, and that's kind of the idea at the beginning. People are using it for different reasons now, but that was always the vision. Uh, and I'm not talking about in the next year or two. I think this is 20, 30 year struggle and governments are getting weaker and weaker. And it's not just blockchain, it's the whole way that digital technology works and will continue to improve. So it's not only having a Swiss bank in your pocket, it's also having the power of an emperor in your pocket, which is what's coming. And so 
is tax evasion, as I see it, is actually that people that are good at tax evasion are going to get even better at it in the years ahead. It is going to get harder, and an increasing burden of taxation will fall on an already aggrieved middle class. Companies are already very good at trying to avoid paying tax. Just wait until they can exist entirely on a, on a blockchain floating in midair. That's what they would love to do, some of these big companies, and if they can, they will. And so this is, this is I think, a long-term problem. Governments are weak enough already. People think they're very powerful, but in democracies, I think they're actually incredibly weak and they can't get things done. And anything that makes it harder for them to do that, I think, is a problem. Final question to the audience before we wrap up. Who feels, after listening to these brilliant people, more positive about blockchain than when they worked in the, walked in the door? And who feels more negative? The negatives have it. Sadly, Vitz, President Vitz, I'm so sorry, but thank you very much, Primavera, David and Jamie. Thank you, audience.